Good morning, everyone. How are we all doing today? Good to see you here today. If you have your Bibles, and you should turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 16 through 18 this morning. And I, uh, I shared a story told by Kent Crockett several years ago, and it bears repeating today. It's one of my favorite stories of all time. In fact, I, I sometimes use the punchline uh, just to remind myself of the moral of this story. Let me, uh, let me share it with you again. A woman named Carol decided she wanted to do something nice for her neighbor. Her neighbor's name was Mrs. Smith. So she baked a pie and carried it next door. When Mrs. Smith opened up her door, she was surprised to see Carol holding the pie. She replied, for me? Oh, thank you so much. You just don't know how much I appreciate it. You are so thoughtful for doing this. Thank you. Because Mrs. Smith liked the pie so much, Carol decided next week to bake her another one. When she took it over, Mrs. Smith opened the door and said, thank you so much. You're so kind. When she took another pie over the following week, Mrs. Smith simply replied, thanks. Carol took uh, another pie over the next week, and Mrs. Smith responded, you are a day late with that pie. (laughs) The following week, she baked another pie, and this time her neighbor said, try using a little more sugar and Don't bake it quite so long. The crust has been a little bit hard lately, and I'd like cherry instead of apple next week, if you don't mind. The next week, Carol was so busy, she was unable to cook for her neighbor. When Carol was passing by Mrs. Smith's house on the way to the store, Mrs. Smith looked through the window and noticed she wasn't carrying a thing. She then stuck her head out the window and yelled, Where's my pie? How many of you heard me tell that story before? I love that story. (laughs) Where's my pie? Now, this story is such a great illustration. uh, I think it typifies a spiritual process that often happens with Christians. Right? It can happen so slowly that we don't even realize that it started. It happens from the inside out. Our attitude, which begins with gratitude toward God, soon turns toward inattentive apathy and in time settles into ungrateful disdain. For some, perhaps, even in this room today or joining us via our online campus, Your whole relationship with God and your prayer life has devolved into this demand. God, where's my pie? So I want to delve into a scripture this morning that will help us in this. Stand with me and let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Admittedly, this is a short text, very short. I normally have longer text, and we're going to explain it in just a minute, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 6, verse 16 through 18, hear the word of the Lord. Paul says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I think we should all say that together. Will you join me? Let's let's read that. It's so short. Let's begin. All, All together. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, bless and anoint your word. Simple as these instructions are, they can make an unbelievable difference in our life. Help us to join with the Thessalonians in their context and understand that it's the same as our context today, and give us a grateful heart, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Today's message is titled, Be Grateful. Be Grateful. In our text today, 
Paul is closing his epistle to the church in Thessalonica. Or when I visited there, I kept calling it Thessalonica because that's what I understand from Scripture, but they call it Thessaloniki, (laughs) which is interesting. I'm like, it's great being here in Thessalonica. You mean Thessaloniki. Yes, whatever. (laughs) The epistle of 1 Thessalonians has two major themes that culminate in Paul's final instructions to the church there. By way of establishing the context from which we understand God's instructions to the church, I want to take a brief look at two looming concerns that occupied the time and the attention of the Thessalonian church. Two looming concerns. And I want you to, to, as I present these two looming concerns for the church, I want you to understand and see how, how familiar their concerns are to ours today. It's it's amazing to me. First of all, the first looming concern that occupied the time and attention of the Thessalonian church is that they were enduring extreme suffering and persecution. They were enduring extreme suffering and persecution. Now, we're not in as a culture yet. I don't think we're where we're going to be as far as persecution goes, but certainly we're in a time of suffering. Many of us are suffering Suffering illness, suffering uh, financial setbacks, suffering. We have times of suffering. And I, I want us to pay attention to the Scripture text because I believe that we're destined for more persecution. Four times Paul refers to these extreme circumstances in his letter. Four times. It's, so, it's such a theme for Paul that four times in five chapters he talks about the suffering and the persecution and the distress that the Thessalonians were enduring. Let me just read them to you very quickly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, You welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering. You welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering. Secondly, 1 Thessalonians 2.14, Paul says this, you suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jewish religious leaders. Third time is in chapter three, verses three through four, so that no one will be unsettled by these trials. They're suffering, distress, persecution, trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. Paul says, we as Christians, listen, we're destined for trials. And everyone said, oh goody. Right? Destined for trials. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. In other words, we warned you it's going to happen. As Christians, it's just going to happen. And then finally, look at 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 7. He says it again. In all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. So it's going to happen. He says it, 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 this was this looming concern that these people in, in, in the town of Thessaloniki were enduring this distress, this suffering. And I know there are several of you, even in this audience today, who have gone through times of severe testing and distress and suffering and persecution is coming. The second looming concern over this church that we can relate to today is that they were confused, ignorant, and distressed about the return of Jesus. They were confused, ignorant, and distressed about the return of Jesus. They were ignorant of, yet obsessed with, eschatology. They really didn't know what was going on. In fact, according to the English Standard Version Study Bible, and I quote, the most prominent theme in 1 Thessalonians is the second coming of Jesus. It is mentioned in every chapter of the book. And I've listed those there on the screen. Jot them down, take a picture, because every, every chapter, Paul mentions this. Why? Because they were distressed. They were stressed out. They were like, they were ignorant. They had all kinds of questions about what's going to happen at the end. When the people die, do they go to heaven? What's going on? And and what a, it's wonderful because we have this beautiful book of 1 Thessalonians that tells us what it's going to happen, what's going to be like at the rapture of the church because of their distress. Let me just quote one of these passages that That kind of gives you an idea of how Paul is trying to relieve their ignorance and their distress. They're stressed out. Let me me, me 
let me just say this before I read this scripture. I know several of you have talked to me. There's stress about what's going on in our world today and how it relates to the last days. I know because you've told me, you've sent me texts, you've sent me emails. You said, Pastor, what's going on? I don't understand what's happening. Yesterday when Donald Trump was uh, attempted assassination, got several calls, several texts. What's happening? Is this the end of the world? <laughs> oh, what's going on in our world today? How does it relate to the last days? This was exactly what the Thessalonian church was happening. Was happening them so much so that Paul has to write about it in every chapter. Let's look at Thessalon 1 Thessalonians 5:23. Look what look how Paul tries to relieve them of their stress. He says, "May God himself, the God of peace, in other words, the God you serve is a God of peace, not stress." You don't need to freak out. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't deny it. He says the Lord is coming, and the Bible says in the Old Testament, I knew it's going to be a terrible day of judgment on those who are destined for wrath, but not the child of God. In fact, he tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the trumpet, the last trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he says this, he says, comfort one another with these words. In other words, don't be stressed, don't be freaked. Look at me, we're going to see a lot more freaky things happen in our culture today, and I believe God wants us to be agents of peace. When the world starts freaking out, what's going on out there? We've got the answer, Jesus. One of his names is what? Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. So Paul says, listen, let the God of peace comfort you and comfort one another. I love it. See, members of the church in Thessalonica had died in confusion about what would happen to them when Christ returned was spreading among them. Furthermore, Timothy, whom Paul had sent to Thessalonica, had returned from Thessalonica to Paul and had told him that they had a lot of questions about the timeline of the second coming of Christ. And so Paul, responding to these Two looming concerns for the Thessalonian Christians writes our text. And here's, in a sense, what he's saying. Here's, in a sense, what he's saying, what he says to us today. Kind of this is Pastor Barry's paraphrase. When in the midst of suffering and persecution, when stressed about Christ's return, make sure you practice these three inner disciplines— in other words, when everything around you is spinning out of control, make sure you practice these three inner disciplines. Be grateful, joyful, and prayerful. We used to sing this hymn, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When everything around me is going, wah, ah, ah, wah. practice these three inner disciplines and you'll be fine. I think we should learn those, don't you? That's what we're going to talk about for the next three weeks. We're going to talk about these three disciplines. I love how Robert L. Thomas writes about this in the Expositor's Bible Commentary. He says, and I quote, these three commands penetrate the innermost recesses of human personality. These three commands penetrate the recesses of human personality. True victories in life for Christians come to those who are joyful, prayerful, and thankful. I love that. True victories in life for Christians Come to those who are joyful, prayerful, and thankful. You want to change your brain? You want to change how you think? Practice these three inner disciplines. Be joyful, prayerful, and thankful. And so over the next three weeks, I want to look at these three inner disciplines. Today we're going to take the last first. <laughs> Jesus said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So I want to touch on the last one first. You say, well, uh, why are you taking them out of order? Well... Let me just say this. 
I think it's much easier. Look at me. I think it's much easier to be prayerful if we're joyful and grateful. So let's start there. Let's start with gratitude, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. Let's begin by looking at some proven benefits of gratitude. Proven benefits of gratitude. I want you to know science backs up the Bible. (laughs) I I love it. Science backs up the Bible. Anne Morin, who is a licensed psychotherapist, college psychology instructor, and internationally recognized expert on mental health and strength, she wrote an article for Psychology Today, which is published on their website, called Seven Scientifically Proven Benefits of Gratitude. Seven Scientific uh, Benefits of Gratitude. And I'm going to just touch on five, kind of condense them down to five. I'm gonna, not going to elaborate on them. I'm just going to list them. I want you to understand that gratitude has benefits to our lives. Let's just throw them all on the screen and look at them. You want to take a picture, jot them down quickly. Again, science backs this up. Science backs up the Bible. Number one, gratitude opens the door to more relationships. A study published in Emotion Journal found that thanking a new acquaintance makes them more likely to seek an ongoing relationship. Number two, gratitude improves physical health and sleep. Grateful people, studies show, experience fewer aches and pains and report report feelings, feeling healthier than other people. Applied Psychology published research that showed that people who express gratitude sleep deeper and longer. How many of you would like to sleep deeper and longer? I know I I would. Adina does. She spent a week at kids camp. God help me. She needs some. She was very busy last week. She needs to sleep deeper and longer. You want to sleep deeper and longer? Get, get grateful, right? It has good benefits. Number three, gratitude improves psychological help, health. Robert Emmons, a leading gratitude researcher, confirms that gratitude effectively increases happiness and reduces depression. Number four, gratitude improves self-esteem. You feel better about yourself when you're you're grateful. A study published in the Journal of Applied Sports Psychology showed proof of this. And number five, gratitude increases mental strength. A study published in Behavioral Research and Therapy showed that combat veterans with higher levels of gratitude suffered less post-traumatic stress disorder. In other words, they recovered quicker from their trauma because they were more grateful. Now, do you think God knows what he's talking about when he commands us for our own good to be thankful? He's like, this is going to help you. In every circumstance, be thankful. So how do we increase our gratitude levels and keep them up? Well, first of all, and this is what I want to talk about next, to increase gratitude... I need to stop. If you're taking notes, write that down. To increase gratitude, I need to stop. There are certain things, I'm going to touch on four, certain things that grateful people don't do. So stop. Stop doing these four things. Number one, stop complaining and criticizing. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, from the New Living Translation, do everything without complaining and arguing. (laughs) See, people who spend a lot of time complaining spend little or no time in thankfulness. Why? Because their perspective is on the negative. They constantly see the bad. It's all about perspective. Do you know what the Hebrew word for gratitude means? The Hebrew word for gratitude means recognizing the good. That's all gratitude is. It's looking around you and recognizing and pointing out and articulating what's good. What's good? Can I tell you? (laughs) This is where I live. (laughs) I confess it. This is where I live. This is something I've been working on. I think I'm doing better at it. Ask my wife. She knows me better than anyone else. I think I'm doing better at it. But this is my struggle, and the struggle's real. 
to increase my gratitude level and benefit from these things that God wants me to benefit from, I need to stop complaining and criticizing. I tend to be a perfectionist, which means nothing's ever good enough, right? <laughs> but I need to stop. stop that, start recognizing the good. Number two, second thing, that, grateful, that, that uh, ungrateful people need to stop doing <laughs> is stop competing and comparing. Stop competing and comparing. See, it's hard to be thankful for what you have when you're always obsessing about what everyone else has, right? If you're competing and comparing yourself to everyone else, you're going to get in trouble. Galatians chapter 6, verse 4, again from the New Living Translation, pay careful attention to your own work. Do you know what that means? That's Paul's very, very tactful way of saying, mind your own business. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Competing and comparing decrease gratitude. Let me tell you what they do, specifically. Competition creates greed, envy, and strife. James talks about this in chapter 4, verse 2. He says, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Whoa, that's extreme. That's extreme, but it's true. You desire, but you don't have, and if you desire long enough and hard enough, you're going to eventually kill to get it. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Competing creates greed, envy, and strife. Comparing creates discontent. Comparing creates discontent. See, we cannot be thankful for what we have when we're constantly comparing it to what others have. We only become discontent with what God has given us when we continually compare ourselves with other people. We need to stop that. Stop that. Number three, stop being a victim. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. The old is gone, the new is here. The old victim, the old traumatic experiences are gone. A new life has begun. Some people can't be thankful for what God has given them in the present because they're still living in the past. Now, let me just say something. I don't mean to be demeaning here. I understand that a lot of people have gone through a lot of trauma in their life, and the struggle is real, and the trauma is real. I get that. I'm not denying that. I'm not trying to minimize that. I'm just saying if we continue to live in our past trauma, if we keep reacting and reflecting and reliving over and over. We keep getting triggered in the now by what happened in the past. We're not going to advance in life. We're going to take one step forward and two steps back. See, stuck victims tend to be blind to the goodness of God. See, victims get stuck. And it tends to blind them to the goodness of God. Can I tell you, if you're constantly looking back and letting the past affect your future, you're not going to see the goodness of God standing right in front of you. It's time to put the past in its place. Where is that? In the past. So let me ask you a question. Has victimization, victimization and trauma stolen your gratitude? It's time to do the work of healing and wholeness, forgiveness and redemption. Perhaps it's time for you to get professional help. That's what I did, and that's what I'm doing. It's okay. Sometimes the trauma is so big, it's so 
It's so looming, it's so overwhelming that we can't even deal with it and it continues to affect our life in the present because of what happened to us in the past. <laughs> in fact, tomorrow I'm going to see my therapist, Clint. May, many of you have met him. <laughs> you wanna, I, can almost, I can almost quote him verbatim. I'm going to sit down on his couch and the first thing he's going to say to me is, you ready to go to work? And I say it often. I say, Clint, you're the only guy I know that I have to pay to do work. I'm going to do the work, but I have to pay you. Doesn't seem right. It's work, friends. Can I just say something? God has wonderful things for you, but you can't let go. You gotta let go. You gotta come to grips with it. You gotta become emotionally intelligent about it. You gotta have these aha moments. Sometimes it takes somebody else to help you so that you can move into what God has for you in the future. I had to. Maybe you do too. Number four. Number four, stop feeling entitled. Stop complaining and criticizing. Stop competing and comparing. Stop being a victim. Stop feeling entitled. See, God does not owe you a thing. If anything, you should thank God that you don't get what you deserve, really. <laughs> Can I confess something to you about 12 years ago? About 12 years ago, my private conversations with God consisted of statements like, God, where's my pie? One of the reasons why I love this story so much, and I love telling it, is because <laughs> Mrs. Smith right here, Mrs. Smith, where's my pie, God? I've been a pastor for so long. I've served you so long. I've been tithing you so long. Where's my pie? One of the first signs of depression is loss of gratitude. I know this from personal experience. In fact, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Let's read it. For although they knew God, human beings, for mankind, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And then what happened? God gave them over. And finally he gave them over to depravity. But it all started with ingratitude. It all started with not thanking God. It starts that way. I like how John... Ortberg elaborates on this concept in his book, Soul Keeping. He says, and I quote, when we take God for granted or believe we deserve his gifts, then we are no longer grateful. You, look, in, you can't be grateful for something you believe you are entitled to. Whoa. And without a grateful heart, the soul suffers because the soul needs Gratitude. Think about that. See, my soul needs gratitude. Your soul needs gratitude. Do you know what was one of the first signs that I was coming out of depression was when my heart began to be grateful again. When my heart began to be grateful again. So, to increase gratitude, I need to stop. Stop complaining and criticizing. Stop competing and comparing. Stop being a victim. Stop feeling entitled. And the second way we need to increase gratitude is to start. To increase gratitude, I need to start. I need to stop some things and I need to start some things. Grateful people have great habits. Several things to start doing which will improve my gratitude, improve 
your gratitude. Let me touch on five real quick, and then we'll dismiss. Here we go. Number one, start confessing and repenting of discontentment. Start confessing and repenting of discontentment. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. In other words, my presence is good enough for you. That's what God is saying. My presence in your life is good enough. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. You see, let me say this. The opposite of gratitude is discontentment. You say, well, isn't the opposite of gratitude ungratitude? (laughs) No, it's discontentment. That's the opposite. Instead of focusing on what you don't have, focus on what you do have. And you have God on your side, the presence of God in your life. That's what you do have. Which brings me to number two. Start seeing the good purpose and presence of God in every circumstance. Start seeing the good purpose and presence of God in every circumstance. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. God, God is at work for your good. God is at work for your good and his glory in every single circumstance of your life. If we could only see that, start seeing the good. Let me say it this way. Because honestly, can I just tell you? It's hard to give thanks for the bad things. Like when I busted my leg, my ankle in three places, and it was just dangling there, my son had to straighten it out because it was like at a 45 degree angle. Just it's hard to go, thank you, God, for my broken leg. Can I just tell you, like, that, might be, that, might, that might be crazy. It might be a little crazy. Don't give thanks for every circumstance, but in every circumstance. In the midst of bad circumstances, find something good to be grateful for. This is what Paul's saying in our text. That's what the text says. In everything. Give thanks. Start seeing the good purpose and presence of God in every circumstance. Number three, start using thanksgiving as a weapon against fear, worry, and anxiety. Start using Thanksgiving as a weapon against fear, worry, and anxiety. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, thanksgiving is a weapon against fear and worry and anxiety. Now let me just say this. Let me just say this. It's important to understand. When I was parenting little kids, I would often make the mistake of trying to stop certain behaviors. Let me tell you something. God will never ask you to stop a certain behavior without giving you something to do in return, something better to do. Remember, my kids were young. This girl up here that leads worship right? When she was a little girl. We used to drive places. We used to drive every holiday like six or eight hours to get back home. And the kids would be in the back seat and they would say, he's touching me. Dad, he's touching me. And I'd turn around and say, stop touching her. Like that's going to be the solution, right? (laughs) Stop it. And And they would stop it for a minute until, you know, the noise in their ears would calm down and then they'd start touching each other again. Why? Because they're kids. Their their attention span is this long. See, God's so much smarter than we are. He doesn't just say, stop worrying. 
Stop it. Okay. He goes, stop worrying and start praying with thanksgiving. You stop this behavior and start this behavior. Replace what you stop with something good. Be grateful. Fill up. Stop this and do this. And what happens when you do this? You release. Look, at, look, at, look what it says in the Scripture. You release the peace of God. Gratitude releases the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, and it begins to guard your heart and build up defenses. I love it that God doesn't just say, Stop it! Stop it and start this. That's so great. It's awesome. Start using thanksgiving as a weapon against fear, worry, and anxiety. See, God hasn't abandoned you. You're not alone. You're blessed. Count your blessings. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and it releases. It releases the peace of God. How many, of you want, how many of you need more of the peace of God in your life? I know I do. I know our country does. Then let's start releasing the peace of God into our environment, into the atmosphere by overwhelming this place with gratitude. Let's fill up this room so much with gratitude it oozes out into our culture. And watch the peace of God. <sighs> start guarding our hearts. I love that. Number four, start getting articulate and specific. Start getting articulate and specific. See, it's not enough to feel grateful. We need to articulate gratitude. Speak it out with our mouth. And it's not enough to speak generally. We need to speak specifically. See, don't just say, thank you, Jesus. I'm not, okay, that's not, that's not wrong, okay? That's a good start, but we need to go somewhere from there. What should we thank him for? Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for my health. Thank you, Jesus, for my job. Thank you, Jesus, for, you know, thank him for specific things. Thank you, Jesus, for provision. Thank you, Jesus, for your strength. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for my salvation. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. And, and, and on and on it goes. Start getting articulate and specific. And number five, start finding ways to up the gratitude game and deepen the thanksgiving discipline. Up your gratitude game and deepen the thanksgiving discipline. That's what we need to start doing. See, one of the reasons that we're not grateful is that we don't want to do the work of gratitude. <laughs> right? We need to practice the discipline of thanksgiving. We need to up our gratitude game. Let me give you some, let me give you some ways to do this. Let me just throw some ways up on the screen. Jot these down, take a picture. You practice one or two of these, practice all four of them, I guarantee you this is, gonna, this is gonna change your life. Change your life. Ideas to up your gratitude game. Begin a gratitude journal. Start writing this stuff down. Get a good notebook with paper that doesn't have acid in it, that when you write it down, it's gonna stay there. Get a gratitude journal, start writing this stuff that you're thankful for, write it down. Number two, start writing thank you notes. Go get a box of them. They're like a couple bucks at Walmart, Walgreens. And start writing, yeah, handwriting. Handwriting? Oh, my goodness, yeah. Handwriting. <laughs> I'm going to take a poll. How many of you have ever got a, like a handwritten thank you from me? I guarantee you can't read it. But my heart is in there. 
See, I'm a left-handed writer, and my teacher kept coming up and taking the pen out of my left hand and putting it in my right hand. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? So I'm, not a good, I'm not a good writer, but the discipline is important. Write it down, right? Handwritten thank you notes. How about this one? <laughs> Practice daily pillow talk. Somebody confronted me after church and said, I'm glad you explained that, Pastor Barry, because I was getting kind of concerned. Here's what I mean when I say practice daily pillow talk. Speak your gratitude before your head comes off the pillow in the morning and as your head is hitting the pillow at night. Pillow talk. Practice speaking your gratitude. Can I tell you something? Your sleep, listen to me, your sleep is going to be so much better when the last thing you say with your mouth before, before you, or in your heart, with your mind, before your head hits the pillow, is gratitude. Thank God. It's going to change your life. And the first thing when you wake up, thank you, Jesus, you've given me another day. You woke me up this morning. I get another day to glorify you, to thank you. Whoa! You change your day. Can I tell you one more story? One more story. Musicians, come. We're going to close this story. One more quick story from my personal experience. When I, when, when, when I was in depression, let me tell you something. I used to go to bed at night. And I, I could fall asleep and I'd wake up two hours later and I would roll over and I, I would see, I would, I would hear my wife. My, my wife does not snore, but she breathes very loud <laughs> and she sleeps. And in the midst of my depression, I would look at her in the middle of the night and I would think, how can she sleep when I'm in turmoil over here? Can I just tell you something? The devil talks at night. Sometimes I'd wake up in the morning, I'd say, you didn't, you didn't, how can we be soulmates? If you don't realize I'm over here in anguish, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out the best way to die so that everyone will think it's an accident. It's turmoil. It's terrible. I don't do that anymore. Thank God. I don't do that anymore. So I practice pillow talk. When I lay down, thank you, Jesus. I love you, honey. You sleep well. Sometimes when I wake up in the middle of the night and I hear her breathing loudly over there. <laughs> Thank you, God. Let her sleep so deep. She deserves it. So wonderful. She can do that. Your, your life changes, friends, when you get grateful. Your life will change. The way you think changes. It silences. Listen, it silences the voice of the devil in the night. The next time the devil, listen, look, look at me. Next time the devil comes to talk to you at night, just start going, thank you, Jesus, for your blood that covers this room. Thank you, Jesus, for your peace. Thank you, Jesus, for your substitutionary atonement that takes away all my sin, gives me peace with God. You want to learn how to resist the devil? Best way to do it. He'll flee. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Ooh. If we could replace the darkness with gratitude, change our life. You with me? All right. Let's conclude with two questions. 
just ask yourself this. Just take a couple minutes and ask yourself this. What do I need to stop to increase my gratitude? Let the Holy Spirit tell you. What do I need to start to increase my gratitude? See, it's time to, to get articulate and specific. It's, it's time to up our gratitude game and deepen our thanksgiving discipline. It's time to start doing the work to change our life. You stand with me and let's conclude this service. I'm going to have our prayer partners to come. If you need prayer this morning for anything, sickness, anything, come to Christ this morning. We're here to help you with that. Dallas Elders, a longtime minister, can pray with you. Pastor Dave, pray with you. Our worship team is going to sing a song. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for all you've given us. Thank you, Father, for your grace. We thank you, Jesus, for saving and forgiving us. Thank you for healing us, for providing for us, for gifting us with your Holy Spirit to convict us and lead us. Thank you for your word, which is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path, Le leading us to the truth. We repent, oh God, for the times that we've complained and criticized. We are sorry for the times we've competed and compared and felt entitled. And as we face suffering and your soon coming return, teach us the inner discipline of gratitude. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Come if you need prayer. Come if you need prayer. God bless you. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all.